Okay, so let's move in to a very important topic where the next two lectures are going to be specifically about fever. And as we all know, fever is a big deal. <laughs> um, it is very, very common. It accounts for about 30% of all ED visits in kids. And there is just a lot of angst about it, a lot of angst about um, fever in, you know, for parents. Parents have a lot of concerns. Nurses have a lot of concerns. Grandparents have a lot of concerns about this. And one of the things that we'll do is also, is we're going to talk a little bit about the history of fever and sort of some practical myths, what we will um we can sort of help dispel. And I, you know, so several, maybe it was like 12 years ago or so, I had to give a lecture on fever to a group of pediatricians. And I was like, oh gosh, you know, this was closer to 15 years ago. I'm like, oh, what do I know? Um, I'm an emergency physician, barely out of fellowship. Uh, what am I gonna have to, uh, you know, to tell these pediatricians about fever? They're, that's their expertise. And so I spent like three months and I read every single article out there, um, you know, every the history of fever, you know, our understanding of fe fever pathophysiology. And at the end of like three months of like countless works, what I can make up in, you know, lack of intelligence, I can make up in, in hard work, right? Um, and at the end of it, I, I was probably not all that more clear after reading all of these things, but I did learn an interesting story. Uh, you know how that original, um, some of the original sort of fever phobia myths of, oh, you can have brain damage after you reach a certain temperature. Well, that was based on like studies from like, I think it was the 1800s, where they like had rabbits that were put over the fire. I mean, it was just very bizarre. I'm like, of course it's gonna damage your brain. Um, but a fever, uh, a naturally occurring fever in a child who has normal physiology, not somebody that's like pan pit that can be pathologically, you know, hyperparexic or child left in a car, you know, obviously a, a, an abnormal uh, um, fever response. Um, a child with a normal physiologic fever from an infectious disease will not cause, there's absolutely no evidence that brain damage or any permanent sequelae happens. Now that said, some children with, you know, uh, very critical respiratory or cardiopulmonary issues, um, medically fragile states certainly may exacerbate their conditions, but the vast majority of kids are otherwise healthy and they're gonna be just fine. A fever isn't going to harm them. And in fact, a fever actually may be beneficial. And it's becoming more and more clear that a fever uh, may help our body so much that, that people have questioned, should we even be treating fevers? Because a fever decreases both bacterial and viral replication. It improves your immune system, demarginates those white cells to fight it. It's very, very protective. And the other thing is it actually makes you tired and sleepy, right? And what's better than any medicine that we have out there is sleep, the power of sleep. Um, that's sort of my practice um, with my own kids or even when I'm sick. I'm like, I, I don't take that many medications because I don't want to falsely feel better. I just want to sleep it off. And, um, you know, my kids tend to, the other day, my daughter was sick and she slept for like 21 out of 24 hours. And then the next day she was like, okay, I'm, you know, I'm good now. Um, the power of sleep, right? So um, back to you know, the whole uh, uh, reaching a number. So with, if you have an absolutely normal functioning hypothalamus system, if you are physiologically normal, you will not reach higher than um, 107. It re very rarely goes up higher than 106. And there's no evidence that causes any harm. So we can sort of reassure uh, uh, parents of that. I have a lot of parents that ask me that question, okay? Like what number should I be worried about? And to be honest, so historically, before we had the HIB and the vaccinate, the HIB, um, Haemophilus influenza vaccine, the strep pneumo uh, vaccine, you know, in the 80s, there was, um, it, it, it seemed, there's a few studies showing that the higher fever, it was more likely to be bacterial. But now, currently with our uh, current vaccination um, uh, regimens, it is just as likely to be viral as bacterial. That's not a data point. Um, except we will talk about the height of fever only matters now in our clinical practice guideline of the young child. But for the most part, the number, you know, of, of fever, it just is a sign showing that they are infected. Hi, Saul. So good to see you. Yeah. 
Saul Bihar just arrived. He's in the house, everybody. Wonderful. Um, so now, um, so we talked a little bit about fever pho phobia. Uh, I mentioned it's the number one reason for ED visits in kids. Um, I already mentioned this, that it will not exceed, okay, it's very uncommon to have a kid with 107 temperature. Usually you have something else uh, going on. If it's very, very high, it rarely exceeds 106. Um, no evidence that it causes brain damage. So I, I tell you guys all of this, I emphasize this just to encourage you guys uh, um, to <laughs> get, spread that information and re assure uh, uh, parents that a fever, it's okay. And it does have some good effects. But as we all know, I mean, when you have a fever, you feel terrible. You get achy, yucky, cranky, and it's absolutely fine to treat a fever. There is, I mentioned that people questioned, okay, should we not even not treat a fever um, because maybe are we causing ha harm? So conversely, there's also no evidence that it really makes a clinical impact impact on the course it, by treating the fever. So please feel free. Um, uh, how I approach this is I tell families, I'm like, we treat the pain of fever. If your child is cranky, certainly make them feel better. Give them an antipyretic to make them feel better because it is uncomfortable, but it's not mandatory. You don't have to check the number every, you know, one hour and uh, um, uh, treat the number. You treat the child. Okay, so a fever in itself is not dangerous. It's just a sign that something's going on. And most of the time it is an infection. And of the infections, most of the time it's a virus infection. Now you can have fever for other reasons. You can have fever with um, you know, malignancies. You can have fever with rheumatologic issues. You can have fever with Kawasaki's. Um, so it can be other things. But common things being common, most commonly it's a self-limited virus infection. Our job, I mentioned in that first lecture, our job is to sort of fight that normalcy bias. We think, okay, it's most likely this, but am I going to do a good history and physical exam to make sure that it's not something more serious, more sinister? And I mentioned, you know, common cause of malpractice, uh, um, uh, missed issues, uh, uh, what we miss, malpractice claims in that zero to two years of life is meningitis. That's one of the things that is on our, should always be on our radar every time we see a kid. Um, what is this, who's at risk for this, and what clinical signs and symptoms? The younger you are, which we'll talk about um, in many slides throughout this lecture, the younger you are, the more likely you are to have sort of harbor a more subtle infection. Okay, so the young infants are sort of a different um, sort of game when it comes to fever. So most of the time, you know, I, I say, I. I tell parents, I'm like, I never checked my, there are two times that I've checked my kid's temperature in my entire, you know, years of parenting. Uh, the first time was when I brought home my newborn baby, my very cute and excited twins had high fevers and they had like these just copious runny noses. And I had this dilemma, like, I'm like, I really want them to bond with their little sister, but I also do not want my neonate to get a fever. And so I had this, you know, anyway, um, they would come run over over, give their little sister a kiss, and they would leave this streak of snot on her cheek, <laughs> you know, and there was one, you know, um, it was very cute, but there was uh, one time I checked my baby's temperature just to make sure she wasn't mounting a, a fever, and she didn't, thankfully, everything was fine. They bonded, it's great, they all three, all three of my girls still share a, uh, the, a room, it was good, it was one, it was probably because they bonded so much um, from day one. The second time, I just wanted, I had read those studies that parents are pretty good at determining if a child is a fever, has a fever or not. And so I tested myself. One of my kids had a fever and I was like, ah, I think she's probably like 102, 103. And I tested myself. She was 102.6. And I was like, okay, I'm a legitimate parent. I passed the test, right? That was my two, two times I've taken a temperature in my kids because it's mostly clinical. Most of pediatrics, and you guys know this, most of the time it's your clinical assessment. How does that kid look? Um, and, and that determines how much we we do is this more likely to be a bacterial infection or not, except in the young infant. One of the things I always say about caring for kids to my emergency residents is I say, well, you know, you shouldn't be too afraid of children 
but you should be a little bit. Like <laughs> we all should be a little bit afraid because young kids in particular, that was the neonate young infant, they can harbor infections that can be a lot more subtle as we talked about in earlier lectures, right? Dr. Sacchetti's uh, uh, case of that infant that just had one episode of vomiting. And it's sort of like, you know, neonates, they're not different species, but they're kind of like the butterfly to the caterpillar, right? It's, it is a little, neonates can harbor a lot of serious infections and it present with a lot of problems and it can be pretty subtle. So we have to just take pause a little bit. Okay, um, so young infants are more likely, they're higher risk for bacterial in infection, and so that changes how we work up a child. I mentioned that a, a number a, a, a in fever doesn't necessarily matter, except in the young infant, uh, the number actually does matter. Are they febrile or not? It is very important in the algorithm, and we're gonna talk about the clinical practice guidelines. So young infants are more likely to have bacterial infections. Obviously, if a kid looks sick, they are more likely to be sick. That's easy, right? We know what to do. Um, we know that they need full workup, full evaluation, history, physical exam. They are going to need IV, blood culture, all of those things. They're going to need a, a lumbar puncture and they're going to, need, going to have to stay in the hospital. That's not a difficult decision for any of us. The antibiotics, we've talked about this a little bit. I will mention, we're going to talk about this in the algorithms um, as they move on. I will say, so we're still treating against a listeria, the incidence of listeria has really decreased um, and hasn't been, you know, uh, um, in several studies, there's one large study from Kaiser, there was zero cases of listeria in neonates. That said, it is such a common sort of a, a bacteria. There's outbreaks all the time. I just heard on the news yesterday about another outbreak, but there's you know outbreaks in various you know strawberries from Mexico, cantaloupe from here. It happens pretty frequently. So we it's still recommended that we treat against listeria, even though it seems like the incidence is decreasing um, because it is a devastating infection. So we do ampicillin and we do uh, um, a cephalosporin, usually a third generation um, cephalosporin, which we'll come back to. Okay, when you're assessing a child, um, you can utilize the, um, the assessment triangle, the tone, uh, appearance, worker breathing, as well as circulation to kind of help you determine is this child sick or not? And here's some more specific information that tickles mnemonic. So it's easy. I mentioned if kids are sick, but what about those kids that are pretty well appearing? And this has been our challenge, right? None of us want to miss a clinically significant bacterial infection. So overall, by far the most common bacterial infections in kids is a urinary tract infection. And there's a big difference between a urinary tract infection and meningitis. And so that sort of helped us move to, uh, prompted us to move to sort of differentiating between the two. Bacteremia and meningitis versus a, a urinary tract infection. 90% of occult infection, bacterial infections in kids is a urinary tract infection. Again, that's easier for us to pick up. We can get urine a little bit better. Um, and those meningitis sepsis, that has a little bit higher stakes, right? Um, high, higher morbidity and mortality. And we have been trying so hard to find the perfect tool to pick up, okay, what is this, this kid who doesn't, especially the neonate, right? They're too young to have a social smile. They can't look you in the eyes and tell you that they're doing okay. They can look clinically well, especially initially, and harbor a significant infection. And these little ones are at risk for they're at higher risk, their immune systems aren't totally functioning. They're at higher risk for these bacterial infection, infections. So we're gonna go over um, the uh, new AAP clinical practice guidelines and help sort of distill, okay, practical take home points. How can I use this in my uh, um, practice as well? Uh, so there's a couple of things uh, that have changed in this new clinical practice guideline. And I think I'll, I'll mention that when we're on the, on the algorithm. Um, not much has changed in this second month of life with the new clinical practice guidelines, but I do want to mention, I know we have a lot of pediatricians here. There's been several studies demonstrating that 
We treat this age group, particularly the second month of life, a little bit different depending on our own personal experience and practice guidelines. A lot of pediatricians are not as conservative with workups in young infants. And probably there's a couple of reasons. One, these pediatricians are very experienced uh, and they see a lot of kids. Um, they know these families. They've got a great system for follow-up. So that's probably a big part of it. And the other thing is in the emergency department, we tend to be a little bit more conservative because we are selecting for a sicker group of people, right? People that, kids that come to the ED tend to be a little bit sicker. In addition, we don't have the system uh, a follow-up. We can't, you know, we don't have a nurse that knows their names and every, you know, their family's names and, and we don't have that connection. We don't have that system of follow-up. Uh, um, and, and so it, we also don't have that relationship. They can't trust us. We don't know them as much. Uh, and so that just makes it difficult. We are dealing with less, less information, if that makes sense. Um, so I just wanted to, to, to say that as a background, there is some variation in practice and that's totally reasonable, especially if you are um, practicing in a clinic where you know your families, they know you, they can return, that's absolutely reasonable care as well. I'm talking about these guidelines um, from an emergency physician standpoint and a lot of um, you know, emergency physicians don't, do not see a lot of kids. And it's important if you're not really clued into the subtleties of difference, it, it, it can be hard even for a, a, an experienced pediatrician to tell between a, a, a sick kid and a not sick kid. So these clinical practice guidelines came out in 2021. Uh, and I, I think they're pretty helpful and just give us clarity and guidance on how to manage these kids. So they excluded kids that were in that first week of life, because there are so many things that can happen in that first week of life, right? So they, they said, we're not even going to address that. Um, all So many congenital bad things and uh, you know, issues present in that first week of life. So we're not going to address that group. Um, they also said, okay, we're not going to talk about kids that have potential HSV infection, premature, those that were really sick or in the NICU. Of course, those kids are at risk for um, a lot of hospital acquired bugs or any issues if they have comorbid conditions or tech dependent. These are pretty much term healthy kids, right? An important thing, I mentioned this already, but I want to emphasize this. In this population, the young infants that were using this clinical practice guideline, a fever, um, you know, a temperature greater than 38.5 or 101.3 is an independent predictor. That is sort of a, a higher risk. Uh, um, it's equivalent to having a higher inflammatory marker. So that's an important data point just in the young infant. That doesn't apply to the older kids that we're going to talk about the, in the next lecture, okay? But it is an important data point for the young infant only. They also said um, there is more emphasis on these clinical practice guidelines about um, herpes infections. Uh, it is, unfortunately, herpes is on the rise and infections are, of course, more likely. So if you have other infections as well, this cl clinical criteria excludes them. So I already mentioned that SBI versus, um, you know, invasive bacterial illness, we're sort of moving towards discussing invasive bacterial illness defined as sepsis, bacteremia, and meningitis. Those are a little bit higher stakes condition. It's a little bit different clinically than urinary tract infection. And this remains true, right? The younger you are, uh, those little ones, they have a higher risk of serious bacterial in, in, infection and their clinical exam is not very good, right? They can't look at you, they can't smile, they can't interact. Now, the epidemiology of these infections, we're still trying to figure it out. Things are changing, um, you know, with immunization uh, status and pandemic and all these things. It's, it takes some time to kind of figure out what's the true incidence of these things. And, and very, you look at various studies, it does vary a little bit. But in general, that first month of life, if you have a febrile neonate, in general, about 15% of them have a serious bacterial illness. And then that decreases to less than 5% in that second month of life. But IBI, remember, meningitis 
and sepsis, about 5% in the first four weeks have one of the, or is harboring that more serious infection. And that decreases, but not quite as much, right, in that second month of life. So that is why we still have some conservative management of these kids, why we're getting labs in them, because they may have bacteremia um, and they may have meningitis. So as you go along this continuum, again, nothing magical happens from 28 days to you know, 30 days. And when you, you cross it, it is, a, it is a little bit of a continuum, but your initial poor immune uh, uh, function and your unreliable exam becomes a little bit better as you move towards two months of life. You, your immune function improves, your risk decreases, and you more, most importantly become a lot more interactive. They can look at you and smile and interact and say, okay, I'm, I'm not sick or I am sick. So the AAP guidelines, again, they don't say anything about that first week of life. They talk about week, I'm sorry, days eight to 21. And really in their guidelines, nothing has changed. This group, you're still doing everything. You are getting, you're pan culturing them. You're getting urine, you're getting an LP, you're getting labs, you're giving them antibiotics. They're staying in the hospital. Nothing has changed specifically there. Here's a, an algorithm for your review. Now that sort of last, that fourth week of life, the 22 to 28 days, this is where a little bit of change has happened. Again, we're trying so hard to minimize um, the risk, do no harm. We want to intervene. We want to pick up all of these serious infections, but we also know that it's not totally benign to admit people to the hospital, to do all, to poke these kids, do all these procedures, admit kids to the hospital. We're disrupting the family. We're impacting breastfeeding. Um, um, financially, there's just a lot of reasons why we don't want to do everything for every kid, right? Our interventions in medicine are risk versus benefit. And so we've been looking, okay, we really want to decrease the amount of LPs and interventions that we do without missing meningitis and finding that sweet spot. Um, so that's why uh, um, these guidelines were created to help sort of make sure what we're doing are, is totally evidence-based. So in the fourth week of life for 22 to 28 days, what has changed is on one hand, it doesn't have to change. If you are uncomfortable and if you want to do the LP and do everything that you do for those younger um, infants, that's absolutely reasonable. They say still do that. Um, they do say there is a role if you have an absolutely wonderful appearing child and your labs are completely pristine, everything looks okay, it's not mandatory to do an LP. But there is still, a, in that, that group, um, there's still about a one to 2% bacteremia risk. Um, so it's, it is recommended that you do give antibiotics and get very close follow-up. Now, I was always taught you don't give antibiotics if you don't have CSF uh, um, cooking, right? And so there's been a little bit of debate and discussion about that. Um, and I, I will tell you, practically speaking, I get that too. Um, there's been a few studies which we'll talk about that um, the outcomes of patients with you know, UTIs and abnormal inflammatory markers, treating them just for the, for the UTI course versus the meningitic course, the outcome is the same. And um, the kids that don't do as well tend to look, uh, look sick. They don't look well appearing. Um, but again, we're dealing with very small numbers. That's not a lot of rigorous e um, evidence in that regard. So I will tell you, my personal practice, usually what I do, what I uh, um, teach is I generally still in this group do the LP because I mean, that was so ingrained in my head. Don't, uh, don't give antibiotics unless you have the CSF cooking because you don't want to partially treat uh, uh, meningitis. Um, but I just tell you, these are the official recommendations and you have to do, uh, you know, of course, as we all know, in, uh, as we, it, when we're practicing, Every patient and family is different and having shared decision-making uh, um, with pa patients and parents, um, well, not patients, obviously, in the neonate, um, with parents <laughs> uh, is, is really important. So I, I give you these, uh, this evidence. Um, so you can take this evidence and clinical practice guideline and utilize what you, um, what you think is best with the patient in front of you.
The guidelines for the second month of life, again, not much has changed. Um, it just very clearly states you're basically doing blood work. You're getting uh, blood work looking for the inflammatory labs. You're getting blood cultures. You're checking urine because, again, 90% of the infections in these kids is a urinary tract infection. If their inflammatory markers are abnormal, um, you have a little bit more freedom. If they have a UTI, uh, you don't have to, you're, it's not manda uh, mandated that you get NLP. Um, so you can look over the algor algorithm a little bit more here. So I want to emphasize this, because this, I think, um, the LP or to not LP is a question that comes up clinically all the time. So bottom line, this, this slide sort of makes it easy. You are doing an LP in the 8 to 21 day olds. The 22 to 28 day olds, if they look pristine and their labs are pristine, you may not you're not mandated to get an LP again, but they have a one to 2% bacteremia risk. So be aware of that. You, you want to give them antibiotics. Um, and then that's that second month of life, the 29 to 60 days. If they look great, um, you do not need to, and their labs are reassuring, you do not need to perform a lumbar function. The clinical practice guidelines uh, really emphasize HSV and they sort of uh, want to put that on our radar. So young infants under three, under three weeks are at higher risk for HSV infections. And all of our inflammatory markers, right, they were created and studied looking for bacterial infections, right? But <laughs> herpes is devastating, an absolutely devastating infection for these little ones. And they may not have normal inflammatory markers. I'll tell you a terrible story. I had a um, two-year-old actually had um, HSV encephalitis. And um, this kid was floridly altered. He, um, he looked terrible. It was not clinically subtle. But his labs were stone cold normal. Labs to white count, totally normal. Procal, totally normal. Um, so I tell you that's horrible. It was, it was a very sad case. But I tell you that just to, to, to remind you that you can have devastating um, viral infections um, with normal labs. It, it, it is definitely um, possible. In the first three weeks of life, we need to be thinking about HSV. It's an absolutely um, devastating infection. We ha should have a low threshold to test and treat in under three weeks of age. And we'll talk about that in a couple slides. Um, influenza testing uh, in indication for treatment is under two years of age. So we should consider that as well. And remember that uh, co-infections of viral pathogens are are very, very common, right? You can have multiple viral infections as w at once. Just because you have a positive respiratory viral panel doesn't mean that it's not also bacterial. It probably decreases it, its risk, but it's not zero, especially in that high-risk population, that neonatal population. Um, so it's still recommended to do the full septic workup in a neonate, even if they have cl a clear uh, respiratory infection. Okay, it's herpes until proven otherwise if you have a patient who has risk factors. If, it's a, if you have a neonate with seizures, that's herpes until, until uh, proven otherwise. If they are lethargic, super altered, if they have vesicles concerning for herpes, um, absolutely treat that. CSF pleocytosis, uh, many experts recommend if you have an abnormal CSF, just treat, uh, if it's less than three weeks of life, um, treat for herpes as well. Less than half of patients have any known, uh, um, have, have any sort of external symptoms of herpes or known risk factors, unfortunately. So don't be reassured, oh, mom doesn't have, uh, have a history of herpes. Don't be reassured um, by that because a lot of women do not know that they have it. Inflammatory markers, so these, for the clinical practice guidelines, I mentioned, I'm going to emphasize it a third time because I want you guys to remember for these clinical practice guidelines, a, at an elevated temperature is equivalent to an abnormal lab. So that is a data point. If it's 
a temperature over 38.5. CRP, oh, that's a typo. It should be higher than 20 um, uh, milligrams per liter. Um, so, um, sorry, uh, we want, we don't want it to be high. I apologize for the typo. I just saw that now. Man, we worked so hard to, to make sure there was no typos. And anyway, um, we're, we're human. Uh, maybe tomorrow I, I will be perfect, but that day is not today. Um, so, it, and remember, know your units, especially if you're working at several different hospitals, you can be off by a factor of 10. So that's really, really important. Uh, procalcitonin, I'm so happy that the AAP cl clinical practice guidelines said, okay, we're going to pick 0.5 as our number because you look at the literature and in these studies, those sort of risk stratification studies, um, some of the studies showed, a, um, looked at a procalcitonin level of 0.15 all the way up to, I think the um, PCARN was 1.71 uh, uh, value. So it was really hard to know what to do that. What's, what's a normal procal? So they chose um, 0 0.5. ANC, less than 4,000 to, to 5,200. And then a normal UA uh, or abnormal UA would be a positive inflammatory marker. Um, so this is just a statement of the, the range of abnormal labs in other studies, but this is the, the this slide with the in, inflammatory markers is the AAP clinical practice guideline. Okay, so overall, that's the bad news is that kids get these infections. The good news is that there is a declining rate of invasive bacterial uh, uh, infections. And meningitis, I mean, it used to be like entirely practically a pediatric uh, uh, disorder, right? Now the average age is, is adulthood of meningitis, which is good for kids because of our great, um, there's a lot of reasons why, because of our great vaccination schedules, um, herd immunity for these young kids, also so we do a good job at prenatal care with group B strep screenings, et cetera, where we wash our hands. We've learned to wash our hands and uh, antiseptics, et cetera. Um, there's a lot of reasons why it has um, decreased. And more, you know, men meningitis rates, again, why we don't want to miss meningitis is because you not only have mortality rates, but also morbidity. So kids that survive, young infants that survive meningitis can have long-term intellectual issues. They have hearing problems. Um, it, can, it can be a lifelong issue, of course. But the rates are, are decreasing. Okay, uh, just to come back to the empiric antibiotics, we mentioned why we give ampicillin um, to treat listeria. Again, although it doesn't seem like it's going to be effective very often, uh, it still is recommended that we give it. And then a third generation cephalosporin. So unfortunately, cefotaxime is sort of uh, not even offered anymore or, or available. So we've moved to ceftazidime. Um, it has better you know, CSF penetration than gentamicin, but gen gentamicin is an alternative as well. Have a low threshold in the neonate, less than three weeks, to also add a cyclovir because of that herpes risk. Um, if there's any risk factors whatsoever, or if the child is ill-appearing, add a cyclovir. And then if they are very ill appearing, if they have meningitis, if they've been in the NICU, any risk factors, you may want to add vancomycin as well, um, just because we have a lot of uh, resistant uh, bugs and, and they may need double coverage. Oh, I mentioned, so Dr. Sacchetti covered ceftriaxone. I think uh, he covered this very, very well. And um, so we theoretically have not been giving ceftriaxone to the neonate because of the um, issues with the calcium, as well as the risk of hyperbilirubinemia. In the new clinical practice guidelines for that 22 to 28 day, the AAP does state that you can give ceftriaxone to that group, um, that group that may have a one to 2% bacteremia uh, rate again, but just be aware of, you know, work with what you have. Um, and if you have a critically ill patient, again, risk versus benefit. Um, but I add that, and certainly that second month of life ceftriaxone, um, there's not controversy. It, it, that is the, the antibiotic of choice. Okay, this is another slide just emphasizing those things as well. Uh, so UTI, we will talk about in the next lecture, um, but we will talk briefly about how to obtain a urine from an infant. Again, usually we're obtaining it via a, a cath specimen. This is the most common uh, route that we obtain a urine in young infants. But has anybody, I want to ask, has anybody done this? 
this sort of spontaneous awesome? Was it successful? I, the literature seems to support that it's quite successful. So getting a clean catch in an infant, um, I, like, I like that. So you hold the baby uh, under the arms like a chicken, and you tap on the suprapubic area 100 times in 30 seconds with a light circular massage of the lumbar area. And, uh, you know, I mean, st several studies have, have supported this. Like, the success rates are pretty good. Uh, you have to have, I don't know, family on board, uh, just like that, uh, that family that got the GU exam. They're like, what are, what are they doing at this hospital? Like, don't, um, you have to explain what you're doing to, uh, uh, you know, to, to families and parents before you do it. Um, but the success rate is pretty high if you want to get a, try to get a clean cat, cat, catch in a young infant. So back to a few fever myths. Uh, this is something that comes up quite a bit. And I remember I gave a lecture in China once and I, uh, the, some of the doctors there got really upset. They're like, yes, teething absolutely does cause a fever. It seems like there's quite a, uh, it, this is apparently a big, big controversy, but there's a fair number of studies looking at this question. And, and pretty much the conclusion is that yes, there are fevers associated with teething, but it's most likely because when your gums hurt, you're grabbing things with your dirty hands and you're getting that virus that's causing um, the fever more than the actual inflammation of the fever because it's a fairly localized inflammation. Similarly, otitis, uh, otitis media is, uh, is a similar phenomenon. It's um, not thought to cause massive fever, but it's more the virus infection that predisposes you to that otitis media as a cause of certainly a very high fever. So main take home points to wrap this up, fever in the young infant. The vast majority of kids are, have self-limited viral infections, but we treat young infants and the neonate a little bit different because even if they look okay, they may potentially harbor more serious infections. Those neonates, they have decreased immune function, limited clinical exam, and increased risk of HSV. So those infants, we really should do full septic workup. That sort of second month of life, we've got a little bit more freedom, but we should be doing labs and cultures on them. We don't have to do an LP, that's not mandated. And don't forget, have a low threshold to check urine in the, in the young infant as well. All right, with that, thanks for your time.